I've been meditating this week on the goodness of God, how good God has been uh, to me personally, to my family, which is now growing and expanding, and the goodness of God in our church, in our congregation. And it's good to meditate on the goodness of God because there are those that would reject the claims of Jesus because of the so-called problem of evil. There are those who would say, well, I can't, I can't follow Jesus. I can't try. How can there be evil in the world and this God be good and all loving like Christians say that he is? And so they'll, they'll completely reject anything Jesus has to say because of the problem of evil. But for me, I think that the problem of evil presupposes that there's something called the good. See, I believe in God because of the, the problem of the good. I mean, how, how can someone call something evil if there's not by contrast something good? What is your criteria for calling that evil? The ancient Christians would say that evil is a privation of the good, that evil is a, is a tear in the fabric of goodness. Uh, if you're interested in exploring themes like this, uh, I'd encourage you to get signed up for the Brothers Karamazov online course. We'll do a lot more talking about that. But while there are those that reject Jesus because of the problem of evil, I believe in Jesus because of the problem of the good. Like, why is there such a thing like goodness? Why is there beauty and love and joy in our world? I say it's because God is here and God is real. We believe that God is creator and all that God creates is good. I love the opening verse of Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. You know, back in the day, we used to memorize Bible verses. I was never very good at that. And I'm still not very good at it, but that's one to memorize. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. I am banking my entire life on that being true. How about you? You know, last month we were singing all those throwback 90s uh, worship uh, songs, and uh, it had me living like in the 90s. 90s, good decade for me. That was, that, everything was happening in the 90s. That's when I had this resurgence of my faith that happened in the 90s. I graduated high school in the 90s. I got married in the 90s. It was, the 90s was good. And uh, back in the 90s, we used to have this thing that we would do, this call and response between the preacher and the congregation, where the preacher would say, God is good, and the congregation would say, all the time, and the preacher would say, all the time, and the people would say, let's try that. That was a good warm-up. So God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Oh, man. That, give yourself a hand. That, yeah. Y'all get a B plus for that. that. That was some enthusiasm right there. I believe that God is good. And so if you put anything in the hands of Jesus, he's going to make something good about it. And so this morning, I want to talk about bread in the hands of Jesus. If you have a Bible, I want you to go with me to Matthew 26. If you have a, a, a physical copy of the scriptures, or even have a Bible app, I guess that's all right. You can swipe it open. Matthew 26, and I'm going to start in verse 26. This is Jesus on the night he was betrayed and arrested. This is the night when Jesus had the beginning of his mock trial, which then spills into the next morning, when Jesus would be sentenced to death. That next day, Jesus would be scourged and crucified and died. But the night before, Jesus was gathered with his disciples, and they were celebrating the Passover. And Jesus was there at the table with the 12 that he loved. And according to Matthew's gospel, this is what Jesus said. This is what happened. This is Matthew 26, verse 26. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread. And after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, 
take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I want you to notice what Jesus did with the bread. It says that there were these four movements that Jesus took bread off the table, he blessed bread, he broke bread, and then he gave bread. This happened in this, this final meal, the, the Lord's Supper, where Jesus was instituting what we now know as Holy Communion. Right? The fancy word is Eucharist, and we'll come to the table of the Lord at the end of our time together. But I want you to hone in on those four movements of Jesus. And what's interesting about those four is that they show up in two other places in Scripture. It's also what happens when Jesus feeds the 5,000. So if you, if you remember, Jesus is, is healing the sick and, and well into, into the afternoon and evening and, and crowds have come. Jesus was in this remote place. He had heard about the, the death of John the Baptist and Jesus departed to a lonely place, a, a remote place, and he wanted to be alone with God. But the people came with their sicknesses, with, with their issues. Jesus had compassion on them, healed them. And this goes late into the day. Jesus knew it was such a large crowd, they couldn't get back into town. So Jesus tells his disciples, y'all need to feed these people, these 5,000 plus people. And they're like, well, all we got are, you remember the story, two loaves of bread, or five, two loaves, of, which is it? Thank you. Five loaves of bread and two fishes. Remember, I don't do numbers in my head very well, right? Counting is still trouble, troublesome for me. So they say, this is, this is all that we have. Well, this is what happens. This is Matthew, earlier in Matthew's gospel, Matthew 14. It says, taking the five loaves and two fish, he, Jesus, looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the crowds. What did he do in feeding the 5,000? He took bread he blessed bread, he broke bread, and he gave bread, and then a miracle happened. A huge crowd was fed. So not only at the Last Supper and in this lonely place in the feeding of the 5,000, but also the same thing happened when Jesus was in the home of two disciples in Emmaus. Do you remember the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? This is after Jesus, his death, his resurrection. There are these two disciples, they're walking on the road and Jesus sort of walks up behind them and, and saddles up to their conversation. And for whatever reason, Cleopas and this other disciple, we don't know exactly who these two are, but they were disciples, followers of Jesus. They didn't recognize that it was Jesus. So Jesus takes the opportunity to have a little fun with these two disciples. And so he doesn't let on initially who he is. So he just jumps into the conversation. What's going on? What's happening around here? And they're like, are you the only one in Jerusalem not to know what's happened about Jesus of Nazareth? And again, it's Jesus, right? But they don't recognize him. And he's like, oh, really? Tell me about this Jesus of Nazareth, right? What do you think of that guy? So he sort of plays along with them and they're talking and they're like, oh, Jesus of Nazareth, we thought he was the one who was gonna redeem Israel. And then what Jesus does is remarkable. As they're walking, he, he, he takes them in their imagination into the Old Testament and starting with the law of Moses and all the way through the prophets, all the way through the Old Testament, Jesus begins to interpret the things that Moses and the prophets were saying about him, about Jesus. And they are amazed by this, still don't recognize Jesus. Well, they're in this in-depth conversation and they come to the little, little side road to take them to their house. And they say to Jesus, like, oh, you have to come and you, you got to come into our house. You got to spend the night with us. And Jesus is like, ah, all right, yeah, I'll go. 
And so he goes into their house. They're sitting at a table. And Jesus, being the guest, was asked to offer the blessing. And here's what's recorded in Luke's gospel. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and whoosh, he vanished from their sight. Jesus had surrendered to the hospitality of these two disciples. And in that home, the same four things happened. Jesus took the bread. Jesus blessed the bread. Jesus broke the bread. Jesus gave the bread and a miracle happened. Their eyes were opened. So what are we to make of this? Because there's a pattern here. And often when we find something repeated in the scriptures, it is on purpose. So what are we to make of this? In three separate incidences, the same four things happened. Here is what I see. Bread on the table is ordinary, but bread in the hands of Jesus becomes extraordinary. Bread in the hands of Jesus at that Passover meal became an extension of his body, of his flesh. Bread in the hands of Jesus in that lonely remote place became a feast for 5,000 people. Bread in the hands of Jesus in that home in Emmaus became revelation that Jesus was in their very midst. And so in some ways, we are a lot like bread in the hands of Jesus. Because if you, if you think about it, bread is pretty ordinary, right? You put bread on the table, it's it, it, bread, bread's pretty ordinary, except for that bread at Texas Roadhouse. That is extraordinary bread. I got an amen back here. I don't know what they, that buttery yeast roll, like that's extraordinary bread. But outside of that, bread is, is, is it's ordinary. It's, it's, it's not the entree. It's not the super exclusive side dish. It's not the dessert. It's just bread. It's ordinary. And we are kind of like bread because I know your mama told you you're pretty special, but the truth is you're pretty ordinary. And we're just ordinary, right? We, we get up, we have our breakfast, we brush our teeth, we go to work, we come home, we raise kids, we pay taxes, we come to church, good job, bonus points. We try to stay out of trouble. We're, we're, just, we're just bread. We're just ordinary. But bread in the hands of Jesus, well, that becomes something different. Bread in the hands of Jesus becomes extraordinary. And so I want us to imagine for just a moment that if we are like bread in the hands of Jesus, then maybe what Jesus did three times with bread, he's doing with us. Maybe we can imagine those four movements as a process of spiritual formation. Do you know that language, spiritual formation? We're being spiritually formed. That's the work of the Holy Spirit to form us into the image of Jesus for the joy of God the Father, spiritual formation. I, I see these four movements as a process of spiritual formation. Let's walk through and see what happens when we find ourselves in the hands of Jesus. Movement number one, First, Jesus takes us. In Jesus, we see God's desire to come to us, to join us in order to rescue us. One of the ways I like to imagine that is to think of Jesus as the great shepherd and we're the lost sheep. Jesus is the wise shepherd. We are the dumb sheep. Uh, not trying to insult you, but you know. As compared to the infinite God made known in King Jesus, all we can really utter is, bah. So Jesus is the great shepherd. We're the lost sheep. And what did Jesus say about lost sheep? It's in John 10. Jesus, or Matthew 18, rather. Jesus said, if a shepherd has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountain and go search 
Go in search of the one that went astray? See, Jesus is the great shepherd and he comes and he scoops us up and he takes us in his hands and brings us to himself, making us his own people. And the good news today is that nobody and nothing can take you out of the hands of Jesus. Jesus would go on to say, this was John 10. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. This is the good news of the gospel, that God's got a hold of you, that you are in the hands of Jesus, that he has scooped you up and taken you out of sin and death and brought you into his kingdom and you are safe and secure there. There's wolves, there's wolves out there, but Jesus promises that we're safe in his hands, that nothing can snatch us away. So first, Jesus takes us. Second movement, Jesus blesses us. We're that bread that Jesus blesses. If people have cursed you, lied about you, spread rumors about you, spoke all sorts of curses over your life, know this, the blessing of Jesus neutralizes the curse. Because in Jesus, we are blessed. Paul opens up Ephesians with language like this. Ephesians chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will. Jesus, when he takes us, takes us just as we are. You don't have to impress Jesus by saying all the right things or knowing all the right Bible answers or being religious. You, you, all you gotta do is just say yes to Jesus wanting to scoop you up. Jesus takes us as we are, but in blessing us, Jesus doesn't intend for us to stay the way that we are. These four movements and this second one in particular is this work of formation and transformation. Because the blessing of Jesus over our lives changes us. Blessing simply means a good word. To, to speak a blessing is to speak a good word. And so while perhaps people have spoken bad words over you, when Jesus speaks those words of blessing, the curse is broken. You get to do life all new again and we become different people. So first Jesus takes us, then he blesses us. Then the third movement, Jesus breaks us. And this is the movement I think that's perhaps the most counterintuitive, right? If you're working with the metaphor, you, you see that Jesus taking us, yes. Jesus blesses us, yes. Jesus breaks us, what? You're gonna break us? I mean, isn't Jesus supposed to be the, the healer of our hearts? Isn't Jesus supposed to be the mender of our lives? Isn't Jesus supposed to be the one that is the peacemaker that's taking broken pieces and putting it back together? Yes. But there is in the process of spiritual transformation, becoming more like Jesus, where Jesus does take you, blesses you, and then Jesus breaks you open. And this is the, this is the scary part of transformation. But the, the, the breaking open that happens by Jesus, I think this breaking open is a, is a breaking us open in vulnerability. And I think it is an action that Jesus does with our cooperation. This is where we get to participate. Right, we just get taken by Jesus. We don't just do much, but say yes. We're blessed by Jesus. There's nothing to do to earn that. But in this breaking, this requires our participation. 
because it is an act of vulnerability. You know about vulnerability? Vulnerability is not necessarily a cultural value. Although I see that there are indications in our culture that vulnerability is growing in its popularity, at least. Uh, I think Brene Brown has a lot to do with that. Brene Brown's 2010 TED Talk on vulnerability is worth your 20 minutes. Uh, 66 million views of that TED Talk. And uh, I can't do the math. Hold on, I'm going to try. 2010, 2014, 14 years ago? Right, a long time ago. So I think Brene Brown's doing good work. And so I kind of see that there is a growing trend to be sort of okay with vulnerability. But vulnerability is where you're not boasting so much in your accomplishments, but you're boasting in your weaknesses. And that's still not really popular. I mean, in our digitally informed world where everything on Instagram looks perfect, yeah, vulnerability is being swept under the rug. But if we want to enter into this process of becoming more like Jesus, which is our great end, which is our great telos, it's where we're headed, it requires us to participate in that breaking and choosing to boast in our weaknesses. Apostle Paul, he does this. Apostle Paul has no problem boasting in his weaknesses. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes, But he, Jesus, said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So, Paul writes, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities for the sake of Christ. Check it. For whenever I am weak, that's when I am strong. There is nothing to be gained by us as followers of Jesus pretending like we got it all together because we don't. Spoiler, we don't have life all figured out yet. There is nothing to be gained by presenting a kind of image where we know it all, where we have all the answers, and we're perfect. I think the best that we can do is, as we are vulnerable, boasting not in our accomplishments, but boasting in our weaknesses, we open up so that people can see the messiness of our lives and see the healing, transforming work of Jesus. Well, that leads us then to the, to the final movement. Jesus takes us, Jesus blesses us, Jesus breaks us with our cooperation. And then final movement, Jesus gives us. We are broken in vulnerability so that we can be given to other people in acts of service and kindness and justice. And this is what I believe will take the transformation within us and create transformation in our communities when we are open, honest, and vulnerable about our faults, our failures, our weaknesses, and show the glory of King Jesus in our lives. Because we are blessed, right? It's kind of cliche, but it's true. We're blessed in order to be a blessing, right? That's, that's the way this whole thing works. Check this out. Galatians chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declared the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the Gentiles shall be blessed in you. For this reason, those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. All right, so if you're not Jewish by birth, congratulations, you are a Gentile. Gentiles were outside of the covenant of God, outside of the family of God, outside of the people of God. But when the gospel, the good news of God's saving plan comes to earth, it comes not in the book of Matthew, but in the book of Genesis. God's rescue plan for a world gone wrong starts in Genesis chapter 12 when God changes the name of one guy, Abraham, changes his name, or Abram, he changes his name to Abraham. When God entered into a covenant with Abraham, that was the beginning of the gospel. And, and this, is what, this is what happened. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country 
and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. See, when, when, when Jesus is taking us or when God is choosing us, if you know the theological term elect, God electing us, election, God's act of choosing is not to choose one and damn the rest. All the way back here in Genesis chapter 12, the beginning of the gospel, we see God's intention in choosing and in blessing is to bless one so that through one, God can bless all the families of the earth. And so if you believe in Jesus, you get grafted in. You get welcomed into this big multi-ethnic family made of Jews and Gentiles and all the races of the earth. We all come together around the throne of King Jesus and we are blessed just like believing Abraham in order to be a blessing to others. So what are these four movements one more time? We're out doing our own thing. Lost sheep. And so Jesus comes and finds us where we are. Leaves the 99. Jesus, what about the 99? I'm leaving the 99. My one lost sheep is over there. So Jesus comes and scoops us up into his hands. And there we find ourselves safe and secure in the hands of Jesus. And so Jesus speaks those words of blessing over our lives. Jesus speaks good words, words of affirmation, words that build us up. Jesus blesses us. And in that moment, Jesus invites us to participate. Then Jesus breaks us open in vulnerability where we can show the the messy insides of our life. And on that messy inside, we can see the healing and transforming work of Jesus. And then what does Jesus do? Jesus gives us to the world so that all of the families of the earth can be blessed. Amen. And so when we participate in the Lord's table, holy communion, what do we find at this table? Shocker, surprise, we find bread. Jesus himself is the bread of life. And what Jesus does with us, Jesus did with his own life. He received the blessing of God. God the Father spoke at his baptism. This is my beloved son. That was a blessing. And then Jesus, his life was torn open, not only in vulnerability, but in crucifixion. And Jesus' body was given to the world. Jesus said this, John 6, 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And whoever comes to me will never be hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Jesus says, I am inviting you to eat this bread that you might live. He goes on to say, verse 51, Jesus went on to say, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus did with his own body what he is doing with us. Jesus was taken, Jesus was blessed, Jesus was broken, Jesus was given. And now this morning you have the opportunity to participate. So if you're here with me in the building, stand up with me and let's prepare ourselves to eat. It's time to come to the table of the Lord and to receive this bread and this cup that we too might experience eternal life. And so everyone is invited. 
If you've joined us online, get together your communion elements. You're invited to participate with us. Everybody in the room, you're invited to come to the table and participate with us. And one of the beautiful things that we see in communion is we see this beautiful partnership between the Trinity and humanity, between God and us. In the practice of communion, we see a miniature version of the big story that the Bible is telling. Again, how did God choose to save the world? God chose to save the world through humanity. God chose to save humanity through humanity. And so when we come to the Lord's table, we see this beautiful harmony, right? Because God makes the wheat, we make the bread. God made the grapes, we make the wine. That idea was given to me by David Witt. David Witt told me that. David and Pam oversee our welcome kiosk. And he, he mentioned that to me after church on a Sunday. I whipped out my phone. I, I just, I jotted that down. I thought, brilliant, David the theologian. So we're invited to participate in God's salvation story of rescuing you and you can experience forgiveness of sins today. If you will forgive your sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive you of your sins. And we'll pray a prayer of confession in just a moment. We experience that salvation, but then we're invited to participate in the salvation of the world because God sent his son not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. So join me and let's make a two-fold confession as we prepare ourselves for communion. We'll both be confessing our Christian faith. We will be confessing our sins and then we'll come to the table. But join me first as we make together this confession of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now join me as we confess our sins together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sins and in humility ask for mercy. In the name of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. And now by the invitation of the bread of heaven, we come to Holy Communion. And this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed, come. It is the Lord's will that those who want him should meet him here. The body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Amen.